right? If there's no other nominations, did we get a second? I'll second. Okay, then moved and seconded. All those in favor of Betty Strange as vice chair will um, go roll call vote. Signify by saying aye or yes. Buddy? Yes. Steve? Yes. Josh? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, motion carries. Buddy Strange will be the vice chair. All right, nominations for le uh, legislative representative. Any nominations? Mr. Chairman, may I make a comment? Yes. Um, I'd like to suggest we postpone filling that until January 14th, okay. where we have the fifth board member in place. Okay. Okay, um, are there any um, uh, issues with that, I wonder? Do we have to have it right now, or do you know? No, we see. No, technically, we're not supposed to do it this year. But the reason we're telling you is because call us oh, was yes. legislative representative. Right, right. Okay, so. When do they meet again? Um, that's a good question. No legislators in session. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I assume that there's probably not a problem in postponing that. Um, I suppose if we had to, we could, uh, we could nominate a temporary or something if we have to, but um, I actually don't know what we need one right now. So I, I can make a formal motion. <laughs> okay. If that's what you want. Um, I, I think that probably would be proper. Let's see. Let's do that. Okay. Let's postpone it to the January meeting. Okay, I, I, I move to postpone the election of legislative representative to the January regular board meeting. I second it. Then moved and seconded to postpone the election of legislative representative to the January meeting. Um, I think we can probably just take a total vote on this. Try to make a roll call. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. We will move that to January. Is that something you want to bring this moment or prefer for discussion? 
Um, <coughs> we, could, we could delay this if you would like until we get down to uh, 9C. Whatever you feel is more relevant. Um, why, don't we, why don't we go ahead and do that? We'll just move on down. It won't take long. All right, so we're going to postpone that until 9C. Uh, 8 is unfinished business. We have it done. 9 is new business. A, acknowledge resignation of Wallace Fletcher, board member of district 3. I move that the board acknowledge the resignation of Hollis Fletcher, Director of District 3. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Anything from the board? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. All right, item 9B, first reading board policy 1630, 3207, 3210, 3211. 3231, 3246, 3247, 3420, 3421. Just a brief overview on these. The way we've been doing this at least is they start off as new business. They're sent out, they're sent to the board, they're distributed to staff. We start the discussion on these policies. Um, some of them we have a couple questions on already. We're checking with our school nurse, especially policy 3420 and the last prevention. Um, and so that's kind of how we do that. We get them out a month in advance so there's time for discussion and then they actually come up for discussion and action at the next board meeting. So I would say there's a lot of uh, policies. We haven't had a lot of policies the last couple of months. Actually, we've had none because our governing body that sends these is kind of going through a transition phase. So we kind of did a dump all this month. So we need a little time to consider some of those. Okay, we'll be taking the deeper next one. Okay, uh, item 10C, Board Policy 1630 is superintendent position status. Um, now, this is a discussion of the board, and I will allow Chris to speak here, but first of all, we must remember now that we cannot get into discussion of personnel. Uh, that's for executive session only. So we can only discuss status of the job. Okay, does everybody understand that as far as the board members? Okay. Uh, also, probably should kind of stay away from personnel things, Chris, pretty much, right? Okay, so I think I'll have Chris speak first and then we'll get into our discussion amongst the board members. You have the floor. Okay, so am I allowed to speak about this <coughs> event? <laughs> when you say personnel, I, I mean, it's nothing that's... I, I think you're fine. When I personnel, I think about performance stuff. And yeah, I, I think that you're probably fine as far as the public, but as far as the board goes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I just kind of, I know that uh, making a commitment to a superintendent, um, that position and an appointment and the contract is something that's on the table. For this board, uh, and, and I know that your preference is to wait until that fifth board members on the board too, so that they can weigh in on that. I just wanted to provide some of my own thoughts on my based on my own experience um, and based on people that I connect with and their experiences um, with Lisa. I, I, I my, it's my personal opinion um, that we have a, a real advantageous opportunity right now to. Um, continue with Lisa's leadership in her current acting position by granting her a, con or a, con a contract. Um, I know that right now it's somewhat expensive to go out and do a search. Um, anywhere in the neighborhood of seven to $10,000 is kind of the current value on that exercise. Um, I know that some past superintendents have not been appointed as a result of the search. So I'm guessing that within the process of actually appointment, that there is some leniency in terms of how the board arrives at this decision to appoint someone. Um, in fact, I think even the last superintendent, there was no superintendent search conducted. Um, so I, I think the thing that I, I just want to share is that me personally, um, I do have some concerns about some of the risks that are involved with the superintendent search process in terms of 
arriving maybe at a conclusion for the preferred candidate to be existing from some outside community, whether um, it's in-state or out-of-state. Um, I think you begin to take on some risk in terms of um, their history with their profession, their career. Um, I also would be concerned about their commitment long-term to the school district. Um, and also just wondering if this is something like a chapter in life that they're planning on trying to achieve even before they're done with their career. Um, I think the advantage that we have with Lisa is that we know a lot about Lisa. Um, we, she has the ability to engage um, the team as evidence by um, the team that she has out at the NACEL Youth Camp. Uh, I don't speak about Lisa specifically, necessarily with all the teachers, but I do see a team of employees that seem to be pretty happy to be there, uh, serving the kids that we serve out there, and with some people that have touched the modern name of spoken highly of her. Um, well, like, works hard, committed, dedicated, works so hard that even one of the board members here a couple of meetings ago asked, is she okay? Because she is not only acting in the current superintendent role, but also the principal of the NACEL Youth Camp. So the fact that she can carry both of those positions simultaneously and keep both of those areas of responsibility afloat is a testament to what she might be able to accomplish if she just had the sole focus of the superintendent position. Um, she lives in our local community here just down the road. She's tied to the community. She grew up in our community. Um, she's visible constantly. She's accessible. We see her at events um, and we see her in public. Um, she knows the NACEL Youth Camp and its partnership as it relates to this district. So that's an advantage in terms of replacing her position or any other administrator that might be out at the NACEL Youth Camp. She already understands that. Furthermore, she's had ex uh, exposure, of course, to uh, administrative duties and the operations of this school district in its entirety. So that's an advantage. Um, she also knows some of the current issues um, that are presented before this district, and having exposure to that gives her a head start in terms of being able to, uh, to develop plans to address those areas. Um, and I also believe that Lisa is someone who, over the course of her career, has been led and has been supervised by certain individuals. And she knows what's been effective in terms of her interactions and experiences with some of those people and what's uh, effective and what's ineffective with others. Um, so it's my opinion that um, there's no need to take a lot of risk by bringing in someone who's an unknown and wondering how they will commit to this district, um, how good of a communicator they'll be, how good of a leader they will be. We already have it here uh, in this district right now. And I would like to see Lisa to be able to develop and share a little bit of what she's been able to accomplish with her faculty out at the youth camp and spread that district wide. Thanks. Thank you. OK, this time um, we'll just open up the discussion to the, to the board. If any of the board members would like to lead off, that would be fine. Anybody that wants to start would be great. Steve? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, well, I just think it's important that we're here right now to discuss this, uh, not only for us new board members to have an opportunity to talk about it, but also to allow the community to have a say in maybe where we, we may go with this. Um, and it's not about, to me, it's not about the individual. It's about how we're going to structure superintendent position down the road. Are we going to do a search or not do a search? Uh, that was something that was raised. That was something that was actually stated by the previous board. Uh, personally, uh, I've been through that rodeo, uh, and it's a crapshoot. Uh, you're rolling the dice, uh, and you're spending a lot of money all of us attended WASDA. Current current estimated cost for a search is seven to ten thousand dollars. And uh, if we were to go down that path, uh, it might be we might find someone that 
really looks appealing, but in reality, after one, two, or three years, the board gets to know that person, the community gets to know that person, <coughs> vice versa. You know, it's been, how long has it been since Dick Grimmerhurst has left? And how many superintendents have we had? I think it's seven, I think. Um, nine? Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Um, I, I, I think we have an opportunity here uh, maybe to uh, rectify that issue, provide some stability in this district so not only the board and uh, community have some uh, feeling of uh, stability, but also staff. And uh, so, you know, I, I would, uh, my, my personal view is to not, not pursue a search. Uh, I think we've got someone, uh, the little bit I've been around, uh, what's going on in the school district in the last couple of months. Uh, the communications I've received are just the law beyond the pale uh, compared to what I've had in, in previous administrations. Uh, it's, I mean, everything is to detail. And, and it's spot on and it's timely. And all of those things are very, very important to me. I, I have a need to know. And, uh, and it's usually yesterday. And uh, so uh, that's just my two cents on the process and where we might go from here. But, uh. All right, thank you. Uh, Larry, Josh? Uh, well, I'm not sure uh, what the actual timing we're looking at for making this decision. I guess my only input, other than what Steve has to say, was uh, I'd like uh, comment from the community and uh, just like Chris has commented, I'd love to hear more of that and I will solicit uh, that from people and I hope that the rest of the board does as well. You know, uh, help us formulate that decision, bring that back that information, whether it be the next board meeting or uh, our uh, protocol is. I have to add is uh I would think it'd be a good thing for us to hear what the staff here have to say also, as they're the ones who are going to have to directly work on their new superintendent. And I, uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with, with all the board members, actually. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Lisa now for, well, directly, for at least six months now, or close to that. And um, and we got to be a little bit careful not to cross the line here in personnel. But um, you know, as from from what I see, is we went from situations that just never seemed to heal up to somebody who um, is a problem solver and and wants to get in there and make things right. But on the flip side of that, I think she's kind of a tough cookie too. You know, and need be. So, you know, I'm pretty impressed actually. And I think we're very fortunate um, to have Lisa right here basically in-house. Um, fill that bill. And it, you know, to kind of speak to what Steve was saying as far as a search, um, it was more of a sort of a timing thing. Um, I think we sort of brought that up um, because if you're going to search, you need to search early, you know. And so, if that process was going to start, we wanted to start early so that we would get the biggest kind of pool that we possibly could. And you know, whether that was ever going to actually happen or not, we at least needed to get that process started, you know, in the works. Of that's what we're going to do. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, although I would like to hear from more community members, staff members, anybody that would like to speak, uh, I'm perfectly fine with that right now, actually, if anybody would like to speak, whether you're signed up or not, because uh, we really need to hear that. Uh, we need to hear it from the staff. Sure.
she does a really good job. I think it would be very fortunate to have her as superintendent and just make sure that if she comes up here, that she can do really good replacement work. I don't think you're going to have a hard time having it. Yes? Um, so we have 10, and I have to say, I mean, as a teacher, um, we're putting a lot of superintendents. Um, and you know now the movie staff, and I have to say, um, she's very approachable, um, very positive, and she responds. I mean, when I have a short time not being able to, you know, work with her stuff, when I, you know, go to her with a, um, a concern or issue, she definitely um, hears me and um, responds. So I think it's very, very important to have the support. And it's not just about me, it's obviously this staff between the children. And so she is going to be supportive. I can see that. And I've already seen that demonstrated. She's very, very busy when she was all in the place. So that's very, very important. And she's already demonstrated that she cares and she's doing Thank you. Ruby, I'd just like to say it is one of the board's most important. I don't know, you know, what the ramifications. I know we always put that as one well, opportunity employer, so just we always dot your eyes and make sure that everything is legal. But uh, with that said, Miss um, um, Nelson has been my boss at Lee's camp, and she's done a really good job, and, and, and uh, has moved us forward in a lot of areas, and uh, um, we uh, seem to be running smoothly. Go to the back, back there, Brian, first, and then we'll go over to the next meeting that everybody said. Uh, it's been a cost of 14 years before this. We threw a few superintendents there. And the very first one I had was probably the best, I'd say, so far. At least it's thrown in a very tough situation. And I think you'd all be that kind of nuts to not to hire her. She's been working for six months, and things have not been decided to better. Uh, and you've got a trial run already. See what she's done. Uh, you guys all mentioned it before. It's a crapshoot. You know, superintendents are you know what you're going to get. You have know, bells and whistles, and when you hire somebody, and you're going to see the real person a few months after that. You've already you haven't had, you won't have to deal with any of that. You already know what you're getting. You know, somebody you know a person. Amongst the staff here, so high that we're, uh, that's just my own opinion. Obviously, I'm biased. I'm at least I graduated with her. Um, but she's very approachable. Communications improved 100% in the last three years. See, you already mentioned that. You can get an email and everything, you know, and you know, I'm not blindsided by anything. So um, I just think you're a board member. You're sitting up there and you're listening to this. You don't so this is too many more responses from staff. I mean, you want a superintendent. You got it right there. Sure. I just want to second everything that's been said as a staff member and community member. I've enjoyed working with Lisa and while when you go to her, was, I worked with her the summer at youth camp and when you go to her with a question, she doesn't always commit to you, but she does listen to what you say and give you her opinion to the extent she can give it and I just always felt listened to. And the times I've seen her here at the school as acting administration when the other administrations were out, she's always composed reported herself very well and is a good presence here and I appreciate somebody local who's invested in this community and has the best <laughs> long term interests of the school and not a short term uh, agenda is what I felt has happened in the past. So we do agree with communication increase which was a huge issue in the last administration. And I think that, yes, we could get somebody amazing from out there, but I think we already have somebody wonderful and amazing here. Thank you. Chuck? Yeah, I just had a question regarding how the process works. Um, and I, I, I do agree with some of the statement that was made by whoever made it, that this is something we need to move very quickly on um, because you know, time is short. But if, if the board is going to solicit input from the community, how would that be done? Well, I mean, we 
done different ways, I suppose. Um, we could, you know, we don't have anything really set up right now to be able to respond on, on our website, right? I'm not sure how you would do that in like a survey monkey or yeah, something. Yeah, or something like that. Like that. Um, I know some people would probably set one up for you. <laughs> you know, I think that right now we're, we're probably looking for ideas on how to do that. And, and you know, I think we're fortunate to have a pretty experienced board right here and possibly solving that situation. So I would, I would, I would look to the board here um, to come up with some ideas on how we might do that. If anybody has some good ideas uh, on how we could possibly do that, or Steve, or Josh, or anybody. But, um, you know, other than coming to the board meetings, um, we don't have anything set up right now to be able to, other than going out and talking in the community, you know, and talking to everybody that we can, and visiting staff at the school. Or, um, you know, I, I know you can. Email a board member just by yeah. clicking on the board member's name. And, and that would we're actually, yeah, we're actually in the process of sort of changing that and getting actual emails through the school for each board member. And I couldn't get all of them. <laughs> it might be just me. Okay. Uh, so I think it might be actually looking to us the board members. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not saying that with. saying let's not ignore the community. Right, right. And, and I, I totally appreciate that. Um, and I I don't know that we're really going to get any different response, but it is very valuable to know what the community thinks. Um, so we'll be talking about that a little more, I'm sure, in the future as to how we can, you know, for right now we can get in the community and talk to people. And, you know, it seems like you know, there's never really enough time, I know for myself, uh, to get up here and be able to, to talk to staff. It, it's tough. You know, I, I know each board member has a little different situation. But for me, with running my business and other things that I do, it's a little bit difficult to get up here when I should. Um, but I definitely will be getting up here some. So. Any thoughts on that from the board as far as how we can well, I, I have a thought on what Chuck's concern was about, you know, getting feedback from the community. Uh, my thought was that we're doing it right now. And that's what I was hoping we might, by having an agenda item, uh, you know, with it being on the website, uh, people are being, are much more aware of what's going on in the school because of that. Uh, I, I was hoping that maybe give a little more interest tonight to where you connect with more folks. But, um, you know, I, I I think from a timing standpoint, uh, I would be reluctant to do anything. And, I, you know, we have nothing on the agenda at this meeting to deal with this issue. Um, uh, we have a vacant board position that needs to be filled, and that person needs to have a voice. Uh, so I, you know, we need to get the whole board in place, and uh, and then from there, uh, I, I think maybe we can have a better uh, idea on where we might go. But uh, I I think it's extremely important, and I very much value what our community thinks, um, and uh, I do not want to assume anything. I want to make sure that once the decision's made, that it's, you know, we've crossed the T's and dotted the I's, and everyone's comfortable with where we're going, and uh, and we have support of the community and staff. You know, I think that possibly between now and the January meeting, um, maybe we should schedule a community night here at the school <clears throat> and get it on the website. You know, get it in the papers, do whatever we need to to get it to the people that we'd like to hear from. More people, yeah. You know, we, we definitely want to get it right this time. You know, I think that we're all pretty much on the same page, and I think this room is too, that we probably have the right person in the room right now. But we want to make sure that the community's on board with that. Um, I think that our biggest goal as a board is to be as transparent as possible. 
to the community, to the staff, anybody that, that wants to know anything that's going on at the school. And um, I think that's the you know, best way to operate. So that's our goal. I don't mean to speak for you guys, but I know we've talked about it before, and I think that holds real true. That, you know, we want to start fresh here and new. And, uh, you know, I think that having maybe a community guide at the school, if we can work that out with all the games and everything else that's going to be going on, right? Half time. Half time. I'm going to run down to the you know, obviously it's going to need to be after Christmas, right? So, um, uh, thoughts on that from the board? Maybe have a page tonight? Does that sound like something we should do? I think that's great idea. Okay, unless, so maybe we could explore some uh, days to do that, try to work it out uh, with the, you know, home games and whatever else is going on, and see if we can't come up with a night. And this is just input, not like an interview thing, like question and answer, right? All right. <laughs> well, we'll decide that. Yeah. Might be safe still. <laughs> still. Okay, so Chris. I, I just want to add one more thing I failed to mention earlier. It's something that I think of often is how directly tied even the superintendent position is to the learning experience of a student. When I think as a parent of a kid um, who's in middle school now, um, being receiving instruction from his teachers and I think how important it is for teachers to feel supported and heard and comfortable and excited coming to work every day and how that translates to effective instruction so that my kid has the best learning experience that comes through the type of supervision and the interaction that they have with the administrative team including the superintendent and when there's a compromise in that style of leadership then you begin to experience some hardships and problems that in probably indirectly can begin to affect the student's learning experience. And so with that being said, I think that's how important it is um, to not take too many chances and to take advantage of the opportunity that we have in front of us. I, I think it, you know, if we're going to do the community night, which it sounds like we probably will, I think it's really important that, you know, anybody that's here and, and you know, is of the same thinking with most of the people that are heard. We need to um, get people to show up, whether it's staff, board members, anybody that's in the audience here. Talk to the people that, because everybody has certain people that you talk to daily, whatever, weekly, whatever, that, that the rest of us don't. And if we can get as many people here as possible, I think that's good. Okay. Um, anything else? Oh, yes. I just had a question. Sorry, I'm going to hold this. But at the next uh, regular meeting, then, will you have on the agenda the hiring of the superintendent? Um, it's a possibility. You know, I, I, I can't say for sure that we will, but I would say that there's a pretty good possibility of that. Um, and I'm not going to speak for the whole board here. I mean, if you want some advertising, you're trying to get more people to come in and discuss it. If you're going to do that, I'll put it in the paper. You're going to do that, you know. But. Well, and I think that it's it's probably important. I think it's a little premature for that. I think it is a little bit premature. We don't have a whole board here, and I'd be reluctant to make that statement until that's everybody has a chance to talk. That's a very good point. I think you know, right now we're probably okay. If we get our new board member in here in the near future get that board member involved in this. And it kind of depends on if that new board member is in place at the next board meeting. I would think so. I hope so. And how close the community uh, input meeting, the community night meeting, is to the board meeting. So that possibly, if we need to, we'll have time to get together with a workshop and maybe go over what we've learned from our community night. Possibly. We may need a little time to digest what we're seeing. Does that answer it at all? You know? Let's see it. I mean, that's kind of around and around, right? But right. We'll right back to the same spot. Anything? Uh, what's the process as far as, okay, let's say we're all in agreement tonight and we 
decided to hire a lease and further negotiation, putting the contract in place. Does that come ahead of the offer? Does that come after the offer? How does that work? As far as the negotiation portion of that? Well, I was thinking when you said we could offer for uh, a position as early as next meeting.
Do you so, want to give a few days to respond after that? So the deadline would be Friday. This coming Friday?
So I'm briefly going to this slide. I believe I need to board this a while ago, a few days. Um, gives us some numbers on top. See up here.
means to me essay. And it's pretty in impressive. The um, vets from the Long Beach branch provided a $100 um, check for first place, 75 for second, and $50 for third place. And we had winners in, uh, in all three areas, in seventh and eighth grade. And in sixth grade, we only had two winners, but that's because the rest chose not to do it. So <clears throat> they missed out on the $50 payback. Uh, but anyways, it, um, I think it was a great opportunity for our kids to um, apply their writing skills. And it was amazing. The, the essays that our students wrote were very, very impressive. And they're now going on to a district level in January. And potentially, they could qualify for state. So we're kind of excited to see what that happens that. So we had, um, okay, it was the news uh, We had um, the, okay, so I, I, I Paul Burns guard, um, and, and um, Cole Norman both, I believe, got the $100, the first place. And um, then Jacob Eaton, also in the seventh grade, uh, got the $75. And uh, Samantha Work in the eighth grade got a $50. Austin tries in eighth grade got $75. But it's impressive that you know, because he's um, all plays well, you know, the, the kids overall did a great job. And it's just nice to see our kids stepping up and the writing skills being demonstrated. I don't know there were so many. I wouldn't have done that, but I would have done that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the amount of money, when you think about it, right? This oh, is the first true. time ever that our kids have actually entered that essay contest. And, uh, and not money. It's very impressive. Nice job. Um, the essays are not, but um, the winners and the, the photographs of them are. And then actually the VFW was going to put it in the, the observer, but he indicated that it was going to be after, I believe, after the district level winners were announced because they didn't want to put several other questions, so it should be occurring, I think, sometime in January. So very, very um, and then I wanted to let you know that um, we have a messenger service. I'm not sure if you know about that. It's a um, call out, it's like reverse 911. And uh, all the numbers for student staff are all loaded in. And so on a late start day, or say for example on an in service day, I would call, make a, uh, record a message, and then send it out to all the families. And it's worked for us. Uh, couple of years anyways, I think um, no one has ever said, with the exception of a few people, how I found out was staff would say, hey, I didn't get my call this morning, and then we'd go in and see, and then the report that I get back um, says 100 you know, phone calls were answered, 110 went to a machine, um, three were disconnected or whatever, and so through that process over the past couple of years, you could you know, do a problem solving. Well, this year, all of a sudden, I started getting this, you know, flood of phone calls and uh, people showing up in the office saying, hey, I didn't get my call this morning, I didn't get my call this morning, and Lisa was doing that too. So I went into the messenger system, which I had already been on, and saw that, hey, you know, all these people got their calls, these went to the machines, and, and uh, the period it was working, and um, so I called the messenger service. And they said, oh, no, 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 it's, it's working, everything went out, and this is our report. And I said, okay, where's the problem? Well, the phone company. So I called the phone company, and the phone company says, well, it's your line distance carrier. It's Sprint. So then Sprint's going, no, it's them. And so this started happening. And, you know, so then Lisa and I talked about it. I spent like four hours trying to problem solve this, calling all over, trying to figure out what's going on. And, um, and what I did was I divided up, separated the school staff um, from the students and sent out two separate messages. And then I had people coming in the next time saying, oh, I got my call, I got my call. Oh, great, it's working. And I started getting emails. Well, I didn't get our call today. Oh, my God. Okay, 
So it's not very efficient right now. So if you hear that people say, hey, we're not getting calls, we're not being notified, we have several um, ways to find out about school delays or closures. We are now back up running with Pomo and King, so they're advertising, they're actually um, <clears throat> showing it online, and, and the last um, cl closure last week, they actually announced and sell repeatedly, so you know they're doing that, and thank you Lisa for, for doing that. Uh, KMUN on the radio is now advertising for us. Um, the hotline can be called, that's our 484 option five. Deb puts the recording on about 5.30 every morning. And uh, Facebook is up and running. Mrs. Gilmore takes care of that. As soon as she gets the information, she puts it on. And, uh, and it's also on the district website. So there are many, many ways to find out whether or not. So if you're here, um, just direct them my way, and I'd be happy to let them know. But I also put it um, in my newsletter that there are other ways in that. And then if you have an opportunity, go by um, the classroom doors in the high school and elementary and after that in here. Um, they've all been decorated by staff. It's kind of a, um, we've been doing activities monthly. We've had some parent heads who've stepped up and, and um, helping to um, promote just staff working together. And uh, so a lot of the um, classroom doors have been decorated for, for the holidays. Test in um, this room just on the other side of it is first place. Mr. Nelson, I believe is second place. And I don't know. Mrs. Smith down at the end, th uh, first grade is third place. So it's impressive um, the uh, creativity that we've had. And then our Christmas program is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Uh, 
um, then we have small crops of tomatoes and corn and a few other things. Uh, in the greenhouse, we've experimented a couple different years with uh, full up on production of lettuce for the camp. Um, this year we're doing some a mixture of lettuce and cabbage and strawberries. Um, We've got some peas growing in there right now, just to kind of see what happens. Pretty much cold weather crops. Um, but real hands on, and, uh, lots of fun. So, uh, greenhouse plant starts. We grow a lot of, lot of starts. This is uh, lettuce and kale growing, and kind of, this is about half the greenhouse that you're seeing in that big picture there. Um, we try to do everything real inexpensively. So we do every, all our propagation from your seeds or cuttings or divisions. And so this would be an example of seeds. And here are big dahlia tubers. And uh, we'll divide those up and separate them. And either spread them out in beds or we'll sell them in a set. All right, so we have some seasonal projects that we do. Um, we do a pumpkin carbon. One of the students who's in this picture said he never even carved a pumpkin before when we went through the activity. Um, we did uh, storing values for the winter, uh, currently making Christmas wreaths. Uh, one of the students are taking those home and taking them to the parents. And uh, like the next level we'll starts some pruning around the house with uh, four or five apple trees. So we'll get those pruned up. Um, the things we work on is uh, we work in flower beds. We have a nice trail that loops around the school, maybe it's a quarter mile, and uh, that's one of the bridges that needs to be repaired, so we'll on that. And that, that last picture on the corner was a picture of a student bringing into class some seeds that he has gathered from his apples and oranges so that we can plant them and get a teachable moment when we learn how many of them. And we can peel the orange seeds so that they actually propagate a lot quicker. Um, the greenhouse pretty much takes care of itself. The only issue we have is, is trying to keep things economical. And we're uh, working out a better heating system right now. It works on electric. And I know the public school one is gas one. We purchased the gas heater probably three years ago and it didn't get put into place. And we're finally kind of getting to the point where we're going to get a tank for us and switch over to gas. And then those other pictures there were pictures of uh, barrels. And we're going to rework all our, our tables for the beddings of the plants and we'll put those on those barrels and clean them black. And so they'll give us solar heat from the water that's stored in there. And so that will cut down on some of our heating costs. So, but that's an in-play in project that may take several years to go through. Any questions on horticulture? How big of an area are you burning? Well, there's five, six, I mean, there's six, seven acres on the camp, so every building has some landscaping. So we kind of pick and choose which one we want to work on. Um, the garden area is pretty small. I mean, it's, you know, it's like half the size of this room. And the uh, greenhouse, I want to say it's 50 by 100 feet. Um, but like I said, every, every bed on campus can be worked on. Um, the hardest part is that the campus has had funding for what really makes landscape bed look good is purple. So that's uh, it's been tough because the kids don't like to lose too much. So when you do go into it, we go in and take it all apart and start from scratch. And we can. So. Any other questions on work? I'd love to come up and see it, actually. Yeah, okay. Well, we want to have you come out and see it. Um, the aquaculture class, same thing. Uh, six to eight kids, usually different kids. Um, this is a program that was started way back with Hank Nelson and Ken Nemo worked on this pro program. Um, we do hire a student. This student does work every day, seven days a week. Feeds in the morning and feeds in the evening uh, the fish. Um, and also checks to make sure everything is uh, a-okay and you're not going to have any issues with uh, not enough water or those types of things. Um, our textbook covers everything from 
history all the way down to careers and kids and all kinds of things uh, in terms of aquaculture from raising frogs and alligators. And, um, it's interesting how you can take that applicability to regular farming, which is, you know, how much you feed a fish is one to one ratio. Food, food to growth versus a uh, um, pig is one to three. So every three pounds of food get one pound of growth. And the fish is one to one, so it's, it's really quite an amazing thing. So, um, so we mainly raise rainbow trout, and uh, we have an agreement with the state of Washington to get 5,000 trout for them every year. And uh, we raise them from high stage to one and a half pound trout. And this is what we did last year. I said that we didn't have a program. We ran a program through my, uh, my uh, science class was a uh, physical science, which didn't quite have anything to do with aquaculture, but we, we made it work, and that's kind of the camp on it. And, uh, and we raised 100 trout, three to four pounds, and they were two years old, and those, uh, they looked like these big ones down here, and those went to the Black Lake Tournament. This year, we're, uh, we kept the 300 trout through the summer, and this was a tough year for us because there was real low water, and we had uh, really big drought this year, and uh, we raised 300 trout, and we still have those trout, they're four to five pounds, and uh, they will be released not just in Black Lake this year to be increased it, but to radar lakes and a few other lakes. Um, we also have a, a, another program that the Fish and Wildlife is working with us on, uh, and that is to raise coho salmon. We, we get 50,000 eggs a year and we raise them from fertilization all the way to when the album emerge. And, uh, and we take them to Johnson Creek, which is where Arnie's ponds are, the road before the school, the dirt road there. And uh, there's been a whole bunch of restoration work down there. You can't really see it in this picture, but there are like chains holding some of these logs in place so that there's nice habitat for the fish. And that's a picture of the area where the, the album will get released. Um, in the past, we've done all kinds of different ways of doing this. We've done it with remote site incubators. We've done it with trays that sit in the water. And uh, we moved to the process of uh, raising the eggs at the Nacelle Youth Camp and then we just transport them once they're ready to start feeding. And then we get to still call them as wild salmon. Fed them that they do well. Are they going into the ponds? They we put a few in the pond, but mainly into the creek and then the lower area there, below the ponds. And why can't you feed them? Well, you can't feed them because then you're going to go into the pond. It's called nutrient enhancement. Right. We can feed them. We can feed them dead uh, salmon. We can throw out dead salmon. Oh, you can't give them fish food. We don't give them fish food. I see. That the hatchery is actually looking for some places to ex expand some RSI work that I've been working on. Right. And that pond site is one of the sites we're talking about. There's been no contact to landowners or anything. But I think I might maybe direct them to you. Uh, so there's some coordination there. That's yeah, all right. At least that they know that we are already doing some things there. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we've been doing this for 15 years. Putting salmon in that area for 15 years. And, um, I haven't talked to uh, this archer recently to find out how many fish are coming out that way, but uh, it's interesting to know. All right, go ahead, Lisa, next slide there. So, uh, last two years we started a new thing, and, and what this did was it, it did two things for us. One is it, it brought fertilization process right to the camp. And the plus for us is it's getting really hard to get the kids off campus. It used to be I could take a station wagon, three kids in the car, and drive them down naturally. It was really easy to get off campus. Now it's much harder to get off campus because uh, there's less staff. And anytime you take more staff, it, it does create a risk on campus. There's lots of folks around. So we've co co-opted with this um, R&D group out of a story called Red Zone. <coughs> Roger Warren and Todd Jones, and they've uh, 
created this foggy incubation system. And we go to the nacelle hatchery, we get, the day we go, we show up, we get 20 pairs of salmon, and we get the eggs and the, the milk, and we put them in plastic bags, and we haul it in a, in a um, cooler, and we take the new camp, and beat up the kids, and we mix the eggs there. And uh, once we mix the eggs, uh, we then do, uh, uh, not from now on, it's called iota 4, which is a, a, an iodine, which then gets out the bacteria that's with the eggs. And then we let the eggs sit in this iota 4 for a bit, and then it gets rid of the bacteria on the eggs, and rinse it off, rinse them off good, and we'll put them in these trays. And they sit in the fog for about 45 days until they're at the eye stage. So we're getting them from fertilization to eye. And the kids will get the opportunity to pick the eggs right on campus. And, uh, and then we'll keep them. We actually have a hopper instead of this. We can either put them in the trays or we can put them in a hopper. And uh, they'll stay with us and then we'll take them in a big uh, Tupperware container and let them uh, all over the area up there. And so this has been, this has been fun to have expertise folks come to the camp. And um, it's been Good learning experience for us. It's been good for those guys, RDs. They're learning a lot. We've got some unique situations that aren't perfect. We've had to, I think the first year we had just this box, and then they moved to something that they call a chiller, which makes that, that chills this part and keeps it colder. This last year, they added this filter in so we can filter the water ahead of time. And uh, we did have some loss this year. It, it, it still is, there's bacteria in the water that we have. And normally a hatchery does formaldehyde, and uh, this operation is supposed to make it so you don't have to use formaldehyde. That's their big plus. But we did still have some egg loss because of uh, some sort of growth in there. And so this next year, I think we're going to do ultraviolet light in addition to the filter and see what that does. So, it's just a good experience for us to check that out. Go ahead and call the next slide. So this is uh, just that process from uh, a couple of years ago, and there's that topic we talked about. The kids make their own uh, egg picking things, and they're fertilizing the eggs there. Um, and then we've had some hatchery field trips. We've had one so far this year. But in the past, uh, the kids have gotten to uh, collect the uh, eggs and milk, and kind of spawn salmon. Um, they've done the wanding and chopping the fish tails off for fish enhancements. Um, done any sort of fish fin clipping. Um, you can't pass a pot latch every year and they collect salmon from the East South Africa for that. And uh, we've helped out with um, some rest swim restoration and we've helped out with the Golden Bay where they've actually taken salmon live and put them into the streams to go swan. Uh, we've got a couple of aquariums at the school. We raise guppies live um, so the kids can see live birth. And we have uh, uh, salmon in the classroom tank. So you know, when our salmon are in the trays, we get to see everything happening. But when we put the salmon eggs in this, this cold tank, which is at 45 degrees, uh, they get to see them hatch right there in front of their eyes. Um, other products we do is a fish dissection. deal with uh, emergencies. This is some, going back to the last point, of this is just some of the native things you find in our creeks there. There's a sculpin, a lamprey, and a crawdad. Kids like to find all kinds of things in our creeks around right here. And uh, that's a picture of something we just added in an automatic fish feeder this year. So that's a big plus. Um, emergencies, uh, when every, every time it rains or any time there's not enough water, we kind of get into an emergency situation and, and then one of the things we teach the kids is to step up to the plate and to, to have an action plan for it and uh, they do a good job. Um, we've got several different water sources you get to, get to choose from. You know, there's a couple springs that we use when the creek's dirty and uh, that usually keeps our fish are pretty safe. Okay. All right, last slide. Uh, 
Now this is this was just from the last couple cold days. It was just kind of fun. We were looking at that the other day, and I just thought I'd show you guys. But what was interesting about this? This one here, this one here, are basically the same ones in Fahrenheit and this is the, uh, inside the fog temperature. So that was inside the incubator, and you can see that the fogger stayed about 37 degrees, so it never got to freezing where the eggs were. But the outside water got almost 32 degrees, so it almost got to freezing when it was 17 degrees outside. And then this last one, so you can see that here, at 17 degrees, the water was almost 32, but the fogger was, the eggs were good. So, any questions on the aquaculture front? There's a lot, I told you a lot. <laughs> Feel free to stop by. We have about afternoon classes. So. Yeah, I have what time is it? What time is your class? Um, our class is uh, 2 o'clock, about 2.10. About 2.10 and, and horticulture is at 1 o'clock. And uh, the hatchery, Mesa Hatchery, provides know all the food for us and provides the eggs, provides the um, they transport the fish for us when we go with them. Um, they provide the pretty much everything. They provide the buckets for our uh, greenhouse and they provide the automatic fish feeder. So it's been a real good relationship that uh, that we built over the years with them. And uh, the youth camp kids working there in the hatchery help them
Have you moved and seconded? All those in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Don't forget your calendar. <laughs> Thank you.